Good morning, uh, and welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee. And today we are joined by Council Members uh, Grudencek, Richards, and Reynoso. Um, today we will be holding hearings on a number of applications, and we will also be conducting a vote on five previously heard applications. Uh, if you are here to testify in an application for which the record is not uh, already closed, please fill out a white slip with the Sergeant at Arms and indicate the name and or the LU number uh, of the application you wish to testify on uh, on that slip. Uh, our first hearing is on LU's uh, 333 and 334, the Katona Park Nursing Home Rezoning uh, for property in Councilmember Eugene's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to rezone the southwest corner of uh, Catan uh, Avenue and Rugby Road from, uh, an RX, from an R3X district to an R6A district and a related zoning uh, uh, text amendment on the map of, to a map of a mandatory inclusionary uh, housing utilizing option one and option two. Uh, these actions would permit the expansion of the existing building located on uh, 1312 uh, Caton Avenue and allow the existing roof deck to be uh, enclosed to provide new space for uh, programmatic use for nursing home residents. Uh, I now open the public hearing uh, on this application. Um, and I'd like to call up uh, Richard uh, LaBelle and Rick Trent, is it? Just push the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Council, will you please swear in the panel? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give uh, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? Uh, as part of your answer, please state your full name for the record. I do, Richard Lobel. Rick Trento. Thank you, Chair Moya and Council Members. Uh, Richard Lobel from Sheldon Lobel PC. We're here today to discuss the Caton Park Nursing Home Rezoning, which has received much support in the local community in the form of a nearly unanimous community board resolution in favor, as well as from the Brooklyn Borough President's Office and the City Planning Commission. The rezoning itself is fairly straightforward, as you'll see uh, in the materials on the first page. The uh, facility is an existing facility. It's a uh, roughly 34,000 square foot facility, and it's home to a 119 bed nursing home, which has been uh, at the property since the mid 60s. The proposal would merely allow for the extension of an, R an R6A district, which is existing on the western portion of the site already, across an R3X district to allow for uh, what amounts to the covering and enclosure of rooftop recreation space, which would now allow for more rehabilitation space and other accessory space for the facility. So you can see from the area map in front of you in the dotted area that's circled at the center of the map, the blue portion of that block is the existing nursing home facility. And you can see that the R3X district exists on the eastern portion while the R6A district exists on the western portion. In the 2009 Flatbush rezoning, the entire area was rezoned, including this block. At the time, however, they didn't really affect the uh, zoning of this property. They merely rezoned an existing R31 district to the R3X district. So if you take a look at the tax map that's in front of you now, the uh, rezoning would affect two lots, the subject lot where the uh, nursing home is located, as well as a 5,000 square foot lot to the south of that lot, currently occupied by a, a Buddhist temple. The Zoning change map is uh, very straightforward. You can see the R6A district equidistant between Argyle Road and Rugby Road on the portion on the left, whereas after the change, it would result in a uh, R6A portion on the right. The R6A district would be extended through to Rugby Road and would be located at a distance of approximately 170 feet from Caton Avenue. So uh, just merely to show you the end result of the plans, on the third page of the plans, you have the sh shaded area, which would now be the enclosed area. Uh, I would say that uh, prior to uh, requesting 
any questions from the committee that um, this is a, a valued facility in this area. The, um, there is a shortage right now within this facility of both uh, central dining area as well as rehabilitative space. So the central dining area and rehabilitative space operate uh, in a way which does not currently meet the uh, standards that are set forth by uh, both the uh, Medicare and Medicaid organizations as well as the Department of Health. And so uh, allowing for this rezoning would allow us to provide more rehabilitative space for patients for a larger central dining area. It would really allow for more rehabilitation to take place in a centralized location, which would prevent rehabilitation from being uh, accomplished within patients' bedrooms. This is often isolating and we prefer to have them in a you know, normal, healthy, circulating environment. We've again received phenomenal support from the surrounding community and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Just a quick question. Uh, so what are the uh, MIH income bands for this project? If you can just go through that. So the uh, MIH options are really gonna be, uh, or intended to be options one and two. Um, the reason for that is that there's no intended redevelopment uh, at either the facility, which is an existing overbuilt facility, as well as the adjacent um, uh, religious house of worship. Um, but one and two, to the extent that in the, in the future there was any contemplated redevelopment, those would be uh, the options and, and, re and uh, redevelopment could take place uh, with uh, greater optionality for, for uh, which level of affordability was desired. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify on um, this item? Okay, uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Um, Thank you, Chair, Council Members. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your testimony. Okay, uh, we're just going to pause for one second. We're waiting for one of our other members to join us. Okay, we've been joined by Council Member uh, Levin, uh, and today we are going to be voting to approve LUs 317 and 318, the East uh, 241st Street rezoning in the Bronx. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment uh, to rezone a number of lots on a single block from an M11 to an R7D uh, C24 district. Uh, and a zoning text amendment to modify Appendix F on the map of a mandatory inclusionary uh, housing area utilizing options one and option two. Uh, the text would also add the rezoning area for the transit zone to reduce uh, parking requirements. Uh, these actions will fa facilitate the development of a new mixed use commercial and residential building. Uh, Council Member Cohen is in support of this application. Um, Uh, we will also be voting to approve LUs 319, uh, 320, and 895, uh, Bedford Avenue rezoning in Brooklyn. Uh, the zoning map change under LU 319 would map an R7A C24 district in place of an existing M12 district. The zoning uh, text change LU uh, 320 would establish a mandatory inclusionary housing utilizing uh, MIH option one or MIH option two. Uh, together, the applications would facilitate the development of a seven-story mixed-use building with ground floor commercial space and approximately 36 uh, housing units. Council Member Levin is in support of this application. Um. I just want to thank uh, Mr. Chair, the, the, the applicant, for working with us and with this committee on, uh, on modest changes to this proposal to ensure that there's more family-sized units. 
um, and, and that would be reflected both in the market rate and the affordable units. Um, we greatly appreciate their willingness to work with us. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Council Member. Uh, we will also be voting to approve on LU 321, uh, the 100, uh, 103 North Conduit Avenue rezoning in Queens. Uh, the proposed zoning map change would establish a C22 district uh, within an existing uh, R3X district. Uh, in order to facilitate the development of a new use group 16 automotive service station subject to future BSA approval. Uh, the site would also include a one-story 3,990 square foot store as well as 13 accessory uh, parking spaces and room for at least five uh, reserve spaces. Uh, Council Member Ulrich is in support of this application. Um, we will also be voting to approve LU-322, the 5153 White Street Zoning Special Permit in Manhattan. The property consists of an existing building in the Tribeca East Historic District, and the special permit would modify certain regulations uh, related to height and setbacks, uh, courts, and minimum distance between windows and lot lines. It would facilitate the enlargement of an existing building while also providing for this continued uh, restoration and maintenance. Uh, Council Member Chin is in support of this application. And lastly, we will be voting today to approve LUs 323, the 59 uh, Greenwich Avenue zoning special permit, also in Manhattan. The property consists of an existing building in the Greenwich Village Historic District, and the special permit would permit the modification of the existing use regulations to allow the provision of use si uh, group six uses on the existing building's second floor as well as the modification of certain bulk regulations related to minimum distance between windows uh, and lot lines. Uh, the application would facilitate the reconstruction uh, and enlargement of the existing historic building while also providing for its uh, continued restoration and maintenance. The speaker is in support of this application and has asked me to note that the applicant has agreed to a prohibition on eating and drinking establishments for the second floor of the building in response to concerns raised by uh, the community board and the borough president. Um, are there any questions from the subcommittee members on any of these items? Seeing none, I now call for a vote to approve the following applications which have the support of local council members, uh, LUs uh, 317 and 318, the East uh, 241st Street rezoning, uh, LUs 319 and 320, the, 80, uh, the 895 Bedford Avenue rezoning, uh, LUs 321, the 100-03 uh, uh, North Conduit Avenue rezoning, LUs 322 and the 5153 White Street 74-711 special permit application and LU 323 the 59 Greenwich Street Avenue 74-711 special permit application. Council, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Aye. Council Member Levin. Aye on all. Council Member Reynoso. I vote aye on all. Council Member Richards. Aye on all. Council Member Grudenchik. Aye. By a vote of uh, Five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. The land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. So we're going to leave the vote open for, for a few more minutes. So we will leave the vote open until the, the end of the hearing, uh, and we will now be moving to... So our, our next hearing is on LUs uh, 338, 339, uh, 340, uh, the 12 Franklin Street Tax Amendment and related special permit application for property in Council Member Levin's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant is seeking a zoning text amendment to include the subject block, which is uh, bounded by Franklin Street, uh, Miserol uh, Avenue, uh, Gem Street, and North 15th Street within an industrial business uh, incentive area and a related special permit that, if approved, would allow uh, an increase in the maximum permitted floor area for specific industrial and commercial uses. 
uh, modifying height and setback regulations and reduce uh, the applicable off-street parking and loading requirements. Uh, approval of the special permit would facilitate the development of a seven-story building with approximately 16,000 square feet of retail space, 96,000 square feet of office space, and 22,000 square feet of light industrial space. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and uh, I would turn it over to Council Member uh, Levin for some remarks. Uh, Chair, I'll, I'll waive my remarks uh, and uh, ask some a couple of questions uh, after the presentation. Thanks. Great. Th thank you, Council Member. Uh, Melanie Myers. Uh, last name Schneider. I'm sorry, I can't make out the first name. Toby Schneider. Got it. Uh, Andrew Till. Yes. Great. Council, please swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Uh, as part of your answer, please state your full name. Yes, Andrew Till. Yes, Toby Snyder. Yes, Melanie Myers. Are we okay to start? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, thank you for having us present today. My name is Andrew Till. I'm the CLO of Simon Barron Development. Simon Barron is a New York City-based uh, real estate development firm founded in 1990. Since founding, Simon Barron has constructed uh, and owned numerous buildings in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. We have a focus and expertise in all facets of development and invest in projects as long-term owners. We're extremely excited uh, to add 12 Franklin Street to our portfolio. It's a unique site on the border of Greenpoint Williamsburg in the heart of an industrial uh, business zone. The mixed use, uh, the mixed commercial and industrial building uh, will build with the approvals before you, will cater to and service local businesses of the neighborhood with a space designated to meet the needs of modern light industrial firms and modern office space of a size and scale that works for businesses and entrepreneurs in the area. We believe that this will be an important building for the area, adding jobs and strengthen employment opportunities in North Brooklyn. Uh, I'm now going to turn over, uh, turn it over to Melanie Myers and Toby Snyder to describe the project and actions before you. We thank you for your consideration. Thanks very much. I do have it on, right? So Melanie Myers with Freed, Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson. I'm going to go a little bit through the actions before you, and then yeah, and Toby will talk about the building itself. From a location standpoint, the, the site that we're talking about is on the Greenpoint Williamsburg waterfront at the southern end of Greenpoint. It has an interesting site. It's across from what will be the future uh, Bushwick Inlet Park and is bounded by a series of streets that kind of give it a, an interesting pentagonal shape. Um, Looking at the site itself, you can see it's a series right now of um, one-story buildings. It's um, underutilized, and it's a site that we think is ripe for uh, pr producing a more of an economic um, development than exists today. From an area map standpoint, you can see that the site is in the midst of a area of, of industrial and commercial uses, most of which are one and two story buildings. But what you can also see from the area map is that there is a lot of the yellow, which is residential. So it's one of the areas which um, it is in an industrial zone and it's one that we think would really benefit from a proposal that would allow for a project that creates jobs to help sort of solidify uh, the, uh, an industrial and a commercial presence in the area. From a zoning standpoint, the site is in an M12 zone, um, and it is close to a project known as 25 Kent, which is the first project that used this particular special permit. So what we think that we are doing with that project, with this project, and what I expect will be um, future projects before you is really approaching and thinking about this um, area as a place to draw businesses and to allow for the Brooklyn um, waterfront to have a strong uh, uh, commercial and industrial presence. From a zoning standpoint, there's three actions. The first is a zoning text amendment to simply make this block an industrial business incentive area. 
that will unlock two special permits, one of which will allow for the building to have a floor area ratio of 4.8, which is the floor area that's available for community facility today. And the third is to address the um, very high parking, and we believe unnecessary parking requirement to reduce the parking requirements and to adjust the loading requirements uh, to sort of more modern light industrial uses. Um, zoning map, the zoning text will simply be adding the block to an existing map that is in the district today. Uh, the special permit will allow for 134,000 square foot um, development, most of which will be commercial. It will, will include 22,370 square feet of light industrial space. Uh, the parking that we are proposing would be 36 self park spaces. Uh, zoning would require for 135 ish thousand square foot building, 396 spaces. Um, this is not an area that needs parking. It's, it's not an area that we, we do not want to encourage people to drive. So we're asking for 36 spaces uh, and we are increasing the bicycle parking that's required under zoning by five. So we'll be having 85, five times. So there'll be 85 park, uh, bicycle parking spaces instead of the <coughs> roughly 17 that are required. Um, this is just simply sort of showing the building in sort of in, in section and I'll turn it over to Toby to start talking about the project in a minute. But the required, the light industrial use will be on the second floor. It will have a strong presence both on the, you know, on the outside of the building and it will have flexible floor plates to allow itself to, you know, to, to accommodate a variety of different users and we're really excited about it as a project. Um, from a process standpoint, we've, um, the community board issued recommendations in support of the project. They had some suggestions about the um, parking um, restriction. Uh, we also received recommendations of approval from the borough president and the city planning commission. And so we're very pleased about the support and the interest that the project had this far and we look forward to your consideration. Thank you, Melanie. I'm Toby Snyder, senior associate at FX Collaborative Architects. Um, as uh, Melanie mentioned, I'm, I'll show you the site here in, in uh, relationship to the building. Um, we are across the street from the Future Park. Um, we're, we're having uh, four sides, uh, four street frontages, 15th Street, Franklin Street, Meserole, and Gem Street. The uh, main lobby would be coming off of 15th Street. Um, there would be retail on all four sides, and then on the southern portion along Gem Street is where there's parking and uh, loading access. <coughs> Uh, just to zoom in here right on the ground floor, uh, again, the main lobby access is here on the, um, on the lower left-hand portion of the building. It also connects through to Gem Street, so there's both pedestrian and um, bicycle entrance from both of those sides. The retail wrapping around on all sides, it's, it was important for us for this project to have an active retail presence on all of the streets. Um, on the second floor, what uh, Melanie indicated as the dedicated industrial floor, um, this is, uh, this is uh, similar to the office floors and being 15 foot floor to floor heights. It's got um, its own uh, outdoor space. It has uh, direct access to the freight elevator and um, oversized corridors if there were multiple um, tenants in it. There's a uh, potential possibility that there's some commercial space on the floor as well. Um, the remaining floor plates as we go up the building are dedicated to uh, typical office uses and the very top two floors could be for a um, eating or drinking establishment as the building sets back from its um, main height to these uh, terrace floors. Some three-dimensional views of the project. Um, you can see that it has a uh, larger core on the south side that is popping out along our lot line condition, but the rest of the building um, is um, predominantly this gridded window system with these large two-story uh, loggia space, outdoor spaces that have been uh, sort of cut out of the frame of the building on, to give each floor its own outdoor space. Um, here's a, a view from Franklin Street um, looking at the main office lobby and then some of these larger two-story spaces. So the, the architectural intent here is to create a building that reinforces the industrial character of the neighborhood. It has a strong reading of its structural grid, which is typical of uh, the larger warehouse and manufacturing buildings of Brooklyn. Um, 
There's a fairly low window wall ratio, which is not typical of an office building, so we're, we're using the notion of these larger sort of factory sized windows broken into smaller pieces, and then of course the, the two story openings. Um, this, this lower window wall ratio is not only sort of part of its architectural character, but is, uh, is one of the most important things you can do for the energy consumption in the building. Um, it really reduces that. Um, it's about half as, what, half as much as what would be expected of a, a, a typical office building. Um, here's a cross section through the building um, right at the ground floor. It is in the flood zone and so we've worked very closely with the Department of Buildings to come up with a solution that both um, enables the, the majority of the space on the first floor and the cellar to be out of the flood zone but right at the perimeter still brings life access and retail presence down um, so there's this um, unique condition of having a, a wet flood proof perimeter band that wraps around the building and is um, enables the certain portions of the building to to withstand the floods whereas the other portions are raised out of it um, so one final view from the the future park we don't know the timing of the future park but this building is very much in um, attempting to bring a uh, important vital um, retail presence and activity and life to that. So it, in many ways, we're trying to address that the future, both the past and the future of the neighborhood. I, I think, thank you. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Just uh, uh, two uh, quick questions before uh, I turn it over to Councilman Levin. Uh, so can you just go into, uh, again, what type of tenants previously uh, occupied the space? Um, sure. There were five tenants on the site. Um, there were two bars within that, one of which was a brewery, but there were two bars. There was a, um, a, a warehouse for Polish canned goods. There was a plumbing supply store, and then there was a sound studio. So of those five tenants, um, four of them have space. Some of them have re relocated. One of, you know, and some of them are in the process of relocating. And the fifth one is looking for space at this point. And, and we believe one of the bars is, is looking for space in the area. Okay, and sort of, uh, can you go into kind of the commitment to uh, good jobs? I think there's a, a couple of things. One of the, one of the, um, you know, the, the goal of the, goal of the um, special permit was to make sure that there was a variety of jobs. So there were a variety of jobs, including the light industrial space. Um, one of the things that I think is really great about this particular building is that the floor plate sizes and the size of it, it's not an enormous building. It's an opportunity for businesses that are in the range of 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, I'm talking 20, about more of those service workers. Yes. And I think from a 32BJ standpoint, if that's what you're asking about, there is an agreement. And I believe that there will be people from 32BJ speaking as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, I now want to turn it over to Council Member Levin uh, for uh, questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, let's see. Um, thank you at, at the outset for, you know, working with, um, with the council and my office and uh, the local um, industrial community on on uh, on this proposal, um, uh, why did you uh, pursue the special permit uh, versus an as of right development? Uh, at a technical level, um, at a technical level, the one of the things that's strange about this zoning. So we're in an M12 zone. Again, community facilities can built be built to 4.8 FAR, and so the building that you see is that size. Commercial zoning is limited to a 2 FAR, so you really would be talking about a building that is less than half the size. So the, there's a challenge in you know in when you're thinking about a site when you're thinking about a site is you know is it feasible viable to build a commercial space you know new a new industrial space at an FAR of two. So I think that might be part of the reason why there's been limited development in this area. So the reason for the special permit is to allow for a two FAR project, which probably would not have been built, to be at a scale that um, makes it a viable project and has it 
uh, generate office uses and light, pr light industrial uses as opposed to just a, c a community facility. Mm -hmm. Community facility being limited to a very, li you know, Actually, uses, yes, right. within this district, the community facilities that are allowed on an as-of-right basis are um, doctor's offices and uh, houses of worship. Otherwise, you need a special permit for to, that would allow some others. Right. Um, now, what kind of tenants do you envision for the light, light, light industrial space, and have you had discussions with local industrial services providers um, on I helping to identify or, or curate the space or identify potential tenants or and what do you envision there uh, and then I have a follow-up question on that sure so we've worked uh, very closely with evergreen um, I believe they submitted testimony to your office um, they were going to come today and they were unable uh, but they've worked very closely with us to help us identify they believe that uh, there is a demand for the space. They believe that it could come from the prop uh, uh, movie, part of the movie bi uh, film industry business that supports uh, Steiner Studios and Storia. Um, they also believe there's demand for um, possible food uh, manufacturing uses. Um, they think there's some other, you know, other various uses. Um, I don't think they believe anything like very heavy, truly light industrial, mm -hmm. um, but they think there's a real opportunity and their sense on occupancy or uh, interest is gonna be closer to when we're ready to deliver because most of the tenants that they believe will uh, will want to take this space are, you know, out, are looking in the market 120 to uh, 100 and, you know, between 120 and 180 days out from their um, current expirations. Okay. Um, the borough president raised the issues of accessory retail potentially taking up too much space intended for industrial use and that quote unquote digital manufacturing might not accomplish the intent of the special permit and so I wanted to know if you had a response to those concerns. Yeah, you know, and it's, that's been part of the conversation. So this is looking at the light industrial space, um, floor and again about 22,000 and change would be for the light industrial uses. Um, and then there's an opportunity for a little bit of commercial, you can see it in the purple, you know, that could theoretically be like a little retail outlet or something like that. It could be a conference room that the entire building could share. You know, so there had been a discussion about whether there could be a limitation, should be a limitation. Um, it was discussed a bit at the borough president, also discussed at the city, the city planning commission. And I think there was a, a concern um, at least with some of the people who are thinking about it, about how some of these, you know, these entrepreneurs, or these light industrial users um, use their space. Um, they, they were thinking about if you had somebody who had um, a, a, had a production bakery, for example. Well, I think we're worried that if that meant that people were coming in and being able to you know, have a birthday party where they were making their own cupcakes or something like that, whether that, having that kind of flexibility would be compromised by sort of establishing a uh, restriction. So we think that the way the text reads is that the space needs to be for the industrial use. Um, and I think the concern when people had concerns was that they didn't want to compromise the ability of an industrial user to be successful. Um, in terms of the types of rents that a light manufacturing or industrial space could could um, could get, uh, the typical range right now uh, in the area is between fifteen and twenty five dollars a square foot, which is considerably lower than um, the office or retail market. Um, do you have a sense of what the price range is on the light manufacturing space and? Um, how do you suppose that will work in terms of if, if it's outside the range of what of what typical light manufacturers are able to pay? Yeah. So I think Andrew can speak to the sort of his sort of their assumptions about it because it certainly is the expectation is that it's going to be a, a well below market rent. Yes, it's uh, it's definitely a uh, well below market rent. We've also spoken to Evergreen about the. Uh, rents for the users they believe would take the space. Uh, their indications were a bit higher than what you're noting. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we have, uh, the way we have um, run this economically is the, uh, our rents are obviously nowhere near the range of the office, uh, office floors, and we don't have an expectation. We have an expectation to fill that space. We don't have an expectation to leave it vacant. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and it was I think part of the discussion at the time of the 25 Kent, is that within the zoning text itself, there's a number of protections that ensure that this space is being made available for the you know, light industrial users and light industrial users only. Um, it includes a restrictive declaration, but it re also re includes a requirement that the restriction be on the certificate of occupancy there are posting requirements at the building. There are third party reporting requirements on an annual basis. Um, there's also a requirement to maintain records online uh, throughout the operation of the building to, uh, to identify who the users of are of the second floor. So there's a number of protections that we believe that are in the text and a violation for what it's worth. Um, you know, it's, it's clear that the violation would allow for a, uh, a removal of a recent rescission of the certificate of occupancy. Um, as proposed, there's, uh, is there a eating and drinking establishment proposed on the, the top floor? Is that right? Or on the, on the there's, a, there's the opportunity or the possibility. So it's possible that what you see is kind of the uppermost um, floor could be an eating and drinking establishment. Uh, the way that the text works um, is that there are things that are called permitted uses which can occupy up to two FAR of the building. And that would include retail uses, um, it would include office as well. Then the incentive uses, which you see in the yellow, um, are, are more limited. So it's office space and things like that. So we do want the flexibility of including a rooftop eating and drinking establishment, but it's possible that that would be office as well. And we would say that one, one of the bars, both of the bars, one of the bars that was there had a rooftop space on the site. Oh, okay. Northern Territory, most of their business was a uh, rooftop. Okay. okay. Um, do you have a sense of what type of uh, commercial tenants you're seeking? Um, we, we think, and from the feedback that we're getting um, from activity at 25 Kent, as well as uh, users um, that are uh, potentially residents of the area, uh, Greenpoint, William, North Williamsburg, Williamsburg, and other parts of Brooklyn, um, are, we think it's going to be a big draw for the TAMI tenants that are currently in the um, Flatiron district that are coming in and out from the L train, mm -hmm. Union Square, Flatiron district. Uh, we think that will uh, revolve around um, advertising firms, uh, uh, architecture firms, um, uh, different maybe uh, different types of, uh, of uh, technology companies. Uh, we, th we think it's a very sim we believe it's a very similar tendency. The thing that uh, we're very uh, pleased with, with the design as well as the, uh, just the you know, layout of the footprint is it really allows for a smaller uh, size tenant who needs a 7,000 square foot requirement or a 10,000 square foot requirement because we're, we're able to easily break up the, f uh, break up the floors. Uh, so I think we're really gonna appeal to uh, groups that maybe will be just coming out of a startup type phase and are able to want to expand and have their own office space coming out of a maybe a, a work sharing mm -hmm. space. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, my last uh, two questions. How do you see the building interacting with the park across the street? Is there a, how do you see that, that kind of taking place? It's the site of Bushwick Inlet Park, which is, yeah. hasn't been built yet, but is, uh, <laughs> will be built one day. So I can talk a, a little bit about it, but you know, certainly the way that it, it, the site has this really unique geometry. So it, we did think about it, um, and Toby mentioned a little bit, is that we wanted it to be something that you know, was welcoming, inviting, and sort of visually attractive from the park, um, but also to kind of lighten up the ground floor so that there 
could be, you know, as pedestrians are wa walking back and forth, that there was visually interesting to them. There might be a coffee shop, there might be something like that. So we, w we went into a little bit of depth about trying to figure out how to make the retail frontage actually have a street presence to try to make that interaction between the building and the street and the people that'll be on the streets as lively as possible. Um, and then my last question has to do with parking. So um, I support reducing parking requirements where, where uh, possible and uh, you have put that into your application. The community board sees it a different way and, um, and wanted more on-site parking. So how, do you, how did you arrive at the number of parking spots and why do you think it's enough? Um, we'll talk, a, uh, so a, a couple, there were, it was interesting. There were three votes at the community board um, on the parking because I think there was a bit of a split of um, d decisions or thoughts about it there. So the community board recommended about 60 spaces, 62 spaces, something like that. Um, the reason why we chose the number is that the site is like located next, it, there, there's good uh, public transportation, there is a bike lane. We would prefer to have no parking in the, the, the garage at all. We looked at it from an environmental standpoint and, why, and thought that there was enough parking in the area that we didn't need to have more spaces and we didn't want people who might be inclined to drive if they have a spot to drive. Um, so we looked at it from that standpoint and we looked at it from the, uh, from the standpoint of what we thought was a reasonable amount that wasn't going to act as um, a, an incentive. And we also wanted it to all be below grade. And so, you know, we have a garage that allows for self-parking below grade. Okay, that's all my questions, thanks. Thank you, uh, Council Member Levin. Uh, Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanna thank Council Member Levin for always being at the forefront of these creative like manufacturing mixes happening in the district and just being very attentive to exactly what we're looking for. Um, we're trying to do something like this, uh, I, I wanna say district-wide, community board one. Um, we think that it's possible to have uh, mixed use manufacturing with commercial, with retail um, in, in the district in some portions of the IBZ or in, or I mean outside of the IBZ. Uh, we're having a little bit of a hard time with DCP getting on the same page, but you being here kind of proves that uh, it can be done and that 25 can is not a one-off. Uh, I wanna ask a couple of questions though. Um, I see that it's a 15 feet uh, height on all floors, except I think the first uh, on the retail space is 14 feet. Uh, traditionally, uh, higher uh, ceiling heights for the manufacturing sections are attractive. I uh, wanted to know if Evergreen had any discussion with you or whether they thought 15 feet was an appropriate amount of height for the industrial uses. Well, um, in this district, we're actually looking at um, light, light manufacturing are the required uses that would go in here and, and um, perhaps higher floor to floor heights are, are more expected and heavy manufacturing, which is not a permitted use here. Um, we're also trying to get all of this area within the height limitation of the, of the um, zoning regulation as it is. But we have shown this to Evergreen at, n at a number of points throughout the last few years. And it seems like there's a number of tenants in, uh, where these kind of floor to floor heights are, are very uh, appropriate for their uses. I, I also wanna say just for Evergreen, they also gave us a lot of feedback, not only on the ceiling heights, but also on the freight elevator sizing, the depth of the loading dock. So they had, they gave us a lot of very good input on that design. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I just want to make sure that if the use, if it's being built, it's going to be used. We have other buildings that have significant amount of manufacturing space that are being used more as a, as a, a empty uh, visual, uh, a visually appealing uh, site and not actually being used, um, leased out. Uh, so they're taking the hit almost as the cost of doing business to have to build to have to find a tenant in the manufacturing side or in the industrial side, so I don't want that to be the case here. Um, the other thing is the price per square footage or the, that you're gonna rent it. I know you, you mentioned uh, that it would be low commercial and office. Um, of course it is because it's manufacturing space, uh, but how low? So 
um, what's the price per square footage that you're thinking about? We, uh, I, I, the way that we've gauged it is we, uh, in terms of on a percentage basis, uh, the way we're looking at the office comps, um, we're going to be in the neighborhood of between 30 and 50 percent lower than where the office uh, will be. So we'll be in like the, you know, in the 30s is where we've underwritten it. Again, we are, lo we are long-term owners of our property. We are not in the business of keeping space vacant. Um, we've been given indications that those uh, rents are achievable for the types of users, but we will see where the market, you know, once we're ready to deliver in terms of what Evergreen's given us indications of when people will actually look to occupy, we'll be, you know, tracking the market. Um, but we're not, you know, anywhere in the neighborhood of where the office, the Class A office market is. No, and I, and I know, and just with all due respect, you keep saying that, but there's no, no one in their right mind that thinks that it would be close to the office space. Right now, when we're looking at high-end manufacturing, um, you're looking at 24 to 26 dollars a square foot um, in parts of, of North Brooklyn. So to go that 30, it's still going to be it's very close. high. You're going to be, you're going to be at the high, the higher end. Um, when I hear that, even though there's some, some conversations that I saw here that you're going to be doing it at um, affordable rates at 20% below mar uh, market, right now I see that. I, I don't see that. So I'm just concerned that you're, if you're underwriting it that way, you won't be able to make, build, you know, uh, pay mortgage um, assuming that you're going to get $30 a square foot unless you're getting some really high-end, you know, uh, manufacturer, which... which could be what you're trying to go for, but that's not, I don't think what Evergreen's goal is when it's talking about finding tenants for you or assisting you in finding tenants. Yeah, again, we've dis we have uh, discussed it with them, and I think the f also, I think the also the fact that um, we can divide the floor up into smaller spaces um, can, it will uh, relate into more efficient space and will relate into a higher per square foot, maybe on those smaller spaces, on a gross basis for a uh, industrial, you know, a light industrial user, that chunk rent m would be, I think, very achievable. Um, I think it would align closely with, uh, with our, the indications and our, and our um, you know, ability to achieve those prices per square foot. Is, it, is there a, an incentive here to ensure that you will not keep that spa space vacant outside of uh, your personal commitment? There's a number of, again, there's a number of restrictions in the zoning resolution um, that are both, which are, are can't, which are penalties on the site. So, again, there's a restrictive declaration. There's, a, you know, something that needs to be recorded in the, in the, against the property. There's a requirement that the restriction be on the certificate of occupancy there's a requirement that there be a public, um, that a website be maintained to identify the users of that space. And there's a requirement of an annual reporting uh, to a third party um, entity that's been approved by the Department of Small Business Services. So there are a lot of protections. It's not just Andrew Till saying we're gonna rent it to the right people. We really can't rent it to anybody but a user. And if you know the the notion that a thirty dollar rent is 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 too high and that there aren't isn't a market for that, then you know the choice is that you don't rent the space or you rent it at twenty six dollars. And you know twenty six dollars sounds better than zero. Okay, and then just two more questions: uh, How many parking spaces are there again? How many parking spaces? Thirty six. Thirty six. Thirty six. And that's um a, the potential. Uh, given a possible waiver uh, approved by Councilmember Levin, um, that that requires a, that requires a waiver. It requires a special permit. A special itself. permit. Okay. And I just want to let Councilmember Levin know that I'll be very supportive um, in giving you that waiver. Um, it's it's remarkable that not only is it environmentally uh, the right thing to do, but financially it makes sense for you as well. And if we're limiting the burden that we have on your economic model by removing parking. Um, and allowing for maybe to have more affordable rents everywhere else because you don't need to build it, I think is extremely appropriate. Uh, and we have to move away from, uh, again, incentivizing vehicles in a place where 
where it, it doesn't make any sense considering it's mass transit options and it's um and it's accessibility to bikes and ferries so uh thank you for for this i'm looking forward to this project i'm really excited about it thank you thank, thank you. you one thing to add to that is it also reduces traffic to and <laughs> Everybody's goal is that. It's, it's always thank the you. car's fault. Thank you, council member. Um, thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public? Oh. Sorry, correction. We're gonna go back to take a vote. Council member Torres. I vote Continu aye, Mr. Chair. Continuing, <laughs> continuing the vote to approve the previously uh, named LU items. Council member Torres. I vote aye. Thank you, Council Member Jump Torres. The <laughs> I have a vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. The land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call up the next uh, panel. Um, Panos uh, Kutiris, Mitch Gibson, and uh, Isaiah Thompson. And uh, you have two minutes uh, to read your testimony. Uh, if you just can uh, state your name, and then you, then you can begin. Anyway, you can. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Panos Kutris. I work as a doorman at 995 Fifth Avenue. I have been a member of SCIU 32BJ for two years, and I'm speaking on behalf of my union local uh, 32BJ. 32BJ is here to support the 12 Franklin rezoning. SDG Property Management LLC, an affiliate of Simon Barron, has committed to provide good building service jobs when their, buildings, uh, when their building opens. These are the kind of jobs that will allow working families in Brooklyn to live with dignity, mobility, and security. The developer's commitment to good uh, property service jobs illustrates their commitment to the larger Brooklyn community and we are pleased to be supporting them throughout this process. For these reasons, we urge you to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. You can just state your name and then you can begin. Uh, good morning, my, my name is Mitch Gibson. I am a Senior Vice President and Chief Program and Economic Development Officer at uh, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. I'm presenting this testimony in support of the project proposed by Simon Barron at 12 Franklin Street. The Brooklyn Chamber promotes economic development throughout the borough and advocates on behalf of our member businesses. The Brooklyn Alliance is a not-for-profit economic development affiliate of the Brooklyn Chamber, which includes the New York City Business Solutions Center in Brooklyn, and we manage that as well. I would like to express our support for 12 Franklin Street project. This seven-story boutique office building on the Greenport, Greenpoint North Williamsburg border has been designed to help alleviate the lack of Class A office space in the area, which is booming res with, with residential development, dining and nightlife options. North Brooklyn residents increasingly would like to work closer to home, and 12 Franklin will meet that need by providing modern, amenity-rich office space that Brooklyn small businesses have come to expect. The 134,000 square foot building, which, which includes 23,000 square feet, dedicated to manufacturing space will reinforce the industrial character of the neighborhood while offering wide open, light-filled loft spaces, access to outdoor gardens on every floor, and an in-building mix of workplace, manufacturing, and retail uses. This project is also expected to help create an active pedestrian and retail corridor across from the new Inlet Park, reinforcing the live-work-play environment that Brooklynites are looking to maintain and grow. The building is just five minute walk from the Nassau Avenue G train station along with numerous city bike stations, um, uh, mopeds, and a 10 minute walk from the North, Bay, North Williamsburg and Greenpoint ferry terminal. Because 12 Franklin Street is designed to encourage public transportation use and help ease traffic congestion, uh, the developer has requested a waiver from the zoning requirement to reduce the number of parking spaces and we also support that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Isaiah Thompson. I'm the Policy Research and Urban Planning Fellow at the New York Building Congress. Um, on behalf of the Building Congress, I urge you to support the thoughtful application brought before you by Simon Barron Development for the building at 12 Franklin Street. The New York Building Congress is a nearly 100-year-old organization working to encourage the growth and success of the New York City building industry and the vibrancy of the city at large. We represent over 5, 500 
constituent organizations and employ um, over a quarter million professionals and tradespeople. Um, the commercial office environment evolves in New York City. Um, we need more space, and this project represents a well-grounded approach to alleviate that lack of office space um, in Greenpoint and North Williamsburg. In New York and across the city, um, workers want to work close to home, and this um, office space really meets that need to provide a modern, community-rich space that Brooklyn small businesses really want. And our members support that and support, um, really as stewards of the urban environment, it's important that we support projects which possess practicality, sustainability, and meld into the infrastructure and character of the neighborhood um, in which they are built. So um, we ask that Summit Baron should be granted a waiver from the zoning requirement to reduce the number of parking spaces in the project. And thank you for your time to be here on this matter. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call up the next panel, uh, Jack Davies and John uh, Nipsa. Did I say that right? Jack Davies. Uh, John, how do you say that? Nipisa? Napisa, John Napisa, going once, going twice, okay. Good morning, Jack. thank you for convening the hearing for the chance to testify. My name is Jack Davies, I'm the Policy and Campaigns Manager for Transportation Alternatives. I'm here today to voice TA's strong support for the waiver from the zoning requirement to reduce the number of parking spaces requested at 12 Franklin. New York needs growth that encourages public transit use, walking and bicycling instead of driving, and we feel that the requested permit, in this case, is the responsible approach to development in New York. Research has shown that when the supply of parking is high, the demand to drive also increases, even when that driving isn't critical. This in turn leads to increased traffic congestion, slower bus speeds, increased air pollution, and compromised pedestrian and bicycle safety all across the city. 12 Franklin is designed to encourage public transportation use and help ease traffic congestion. The building is just a five minute walk from the Nassau Ave G train station, along with numerous city bike stations, Revel electric mopeds, and a 10 minute walk from the North Williamsburg and Greenpoint New York City ferry stations. As traffic congestion, safety, and pollution reach crisis levels in New York, we should not be encouraging development that needlessly keeps more cars on the road. Granting the requested per permit would set an important precedent, not only in development best practices, but in prioritizing people over motor vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be uh, laid over. Uh, our next hearing is on LU's uh, 331 uh, three and 332, the Douglaston Parkway rezoning for property and council member of Alone's district in Queens. Uh, the applicant seeks a zoning map amendment to rezone the west side of Douglaston Parkway from Northern Boulevard and extending to uh, north approximately 700 feet to a uh, varying depth of approximately 170 feet. Uh, the map amendment would rezone an existing R12 uh, district and an R6A uh, C12 district. There is a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing MIH option one or option two. These actions would facilitate the development of an eight-story building and a five-story building, resulting in a total of 83 dwelling units of which 34 would be affordable independent residents uh, for seniors, or as we call them, heirs, in accordance with the MIH program, as well as 12,678 uh, square feet of commercial uh, floor area. Um, I now want to uh, open the public hearing on this application, but I'm going to read uh, Council Member Vallone's remarks uh, before we, we uh, get to the panel. Uh, the the proposed action by the applicant would construct an eight-story residential building containing 24 residential units and 17 accessory parking spaces at 4380 Douglaston Parkway and construct a five-story mixed-use building containing 
a 12,678 square foot uh, ground floor restaurant and 59 residential units with 89 accessory parking spaces at uh, 241-15 Northern Boulevard. It is important to note this property at 241-15 Northern Boulevard has a variance that would allow construction of a three-story building. The community board members uh, at their public hearing overwhelmingly opposed this application due to concerns about lack of parking, increased traffic, fears of Northern Boulevard being rezoned by the de Blasio administration, and reduced quality of life. However, concerns remain from uh, our office and the borough president's office as to the unfortunate procedures uh, and inflammatory language that was permitted uh, at the said meeting. The applicant uh, was not allowed to present prior to the discussion comments and voting on this matter. Uh, any project must be given a fair opportunity to be heard. This, unfortunately, uh, was not followed. Uh, in fact, unfounded comments about homeless shelters as well as other disturbing statements were made and written by members of the board and the community, which must be taken in totality uh, with this application. It is important to note that there are already existing traffic issues at this area and th that have been exacerbated by the recent installation of a uh, contentious bike lane uh, on Northern Boulevard. The applicant's uh, builder's uh, pavement plan must be reviewed by uh, DOT and DOB to mitigate traffic concerns on Northern Boulevard and Douglaston Parkway. In November 2018, Queensborough President Melinda Katz reviewed the rezoning and recommended that the eight-story building be lowered to seven stories to match the adjacent buildings and that the applicant coordinates with the Department of Transportation to mitigate any potential traffic congestion uh, during construction and after completion. Furthermore, she indicated that there is an acute need in Queens for affordable housing, particularly for seniors. In light of these concerns, the borough president disapproved of the zoning map amendment district application and approved the zoning resolution text amendment to designate the project a mandatory inclusionary housing designated area. It is my understanding that the applicant is willing to make a number of concessions since borough president Katz's public hearing. Conversations with the council's land use division Council Member uh, Paul Vallone's office and the applicant uh, have discussed the following uh, that should uh, commit to. Uh, committing to work with stakeholders with binding restrictive deed language uh, to both parcels of land, including uh, minimum, uh, to, including mi to minimize the proposed number of parking spaces, reducing the uh, building height on the development site uh, one, which limits and limits on its use. In addition to restrictive deed language, the housing must be marketed uh, to all seniors with a local uh, preference for Community Board 11. The proposal only requires 30% of affordable senior housing, and we must receive assurances that only seniors will occupy all residential units. Uh, the applicant has agreed to have Hannock uh, serve as the administrative agent for both buildings, an essential part of this potential project. Uh, affordable senior housing is undeniably one of the greatest needs and concerns in Queens and throughout the city of New York. Uh, projections by the city planning see the number of Queens residents 65 and older uh, are jumping to 3,777,000 by 2040, a 31% change from the 2010 figure of 288,000. Uh, as we all know, Eastern Queens has the largest population of seniors in the city of New York. Uh, based on the ongoing concerns about uh, the history of this site, we still have reservations regarding this application and thank Chair Moya and members of this committee uh, for hearing this matter today. Uh, we are joined by uh, Council uh, Member Rivera uh, and now I call up uh, Paola uh, Duran and Jocelyn Sakarina, is that right? Jacqueline, I'm sorry. Thank do you. you. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? Uh, in part of your response, please state your full name. You gotta press the button. I will, Jacqueline Scarinci. I will, Paola Duran. 
Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the Zoning and Franchises Committee. My name is Jacqueline Skrinchi of Ackerman LLP, representing the applicants 241-15 Northern LLC and North Shore Realty Corp in connection with the proposed rezoning action. I'm joined here today by Paula Duran of Hannock, who is the nonprofit organization that will be partnering with the developers of this project to ensure that quality senior housing and affordable housing is maintained at the project. The proposed zoning map amendment will facilitate the development of two underutilized lots with two much needed senior housing buildings, uh, which will include a five-story residential building with a ground floor eating and drinking establishment and an, eight, uh, an eight-story proposed uh, residential building. In addition, the proposed zoning changes will better reflect the existing non-complying residential developments that exist today. The project site location is located in Queens Community District 11 in Douglaston, Queens, and it's located at the northwest corner of Northern Boulevard and uh, Douglaston Parkway. Northern Boulevard is a major east-west route uh, to the north shore of Long Island in this, in this uh, section of Queens, and also eight, Douglaston Parkway is an 80-foot wide um, street. The project area adjoins the 657-acre Alley Pound Park and is located very, very close to the Douglaston Long Island Railroad stop, which is located just to the northwest of the site. Development site 1, 4380 Douglaston Parkway is currently vacant, and development site 2, 241-15 Northern Boulevard, which is located at the corner, is a one-story, um, it, it used to be an a one-story automotive service station, but it's currently used as parking for the Giardino's restaurant, which is located across the street. The current zoning for the site is in R12. Um, however, as you can see with, within the proposed rezoning area uh, for this R6A, there are three existing uh, non-complying and non-conforming buildings, <coughs> since the R12 would only permit single-family residential homes um, at a 0.5 FAR. Uh, these existing buildings are overbuilt um, and also would be brought into compliance with the proposed, re not into compliance, uh, would substantially comply um, with the proposed rezoning, which would permit a 3.9 FAR for um, developments that would provide affordable independent residences for seniors. Just to show you the existing site conditions, um, this is a view of the corner lot, which is um, cons cons referred to as development site two. Um, there are exist these existing pre-war buildings that are six stories in height already, even though this is an R12 zoning. Um, and then this is the site of development site one, which is just currently a vacant lot. Um, our, our rezoning proposal to an R6A would facilitate a, um, our two zoning actions, our zoning map amendment to rezone from an R12 to an R6A and R6A C12, and also a zoning text amendment to designate the project area mandatory inclusionary housing area. It's just the zoning change map, project area. And um, the applicant mapped both option one and option two, um, but based on the AMIs within the area has proposed option two for this site, um, also because we're proposing the MIH component to be affordable independent residences for seniors. It works well um, to have the units that are restricted at 80% AMI and below. And just a little bit about Hannock, um, I'm going to allow Paolo to uh, speak about the the work that Hannock does throughout New York City with senior housing and particularly <coughs> affordable senior housing um, in a little bit as soon as I finish. Um, just quickly an overview on, on the two developments. Development, this 241-15 will have approximately 59 dwelling units, of which 20 would be the affordable independent residences for seniors. The entire building is intended to be marketed to seniors 55 and over. 
and the ground floor will be a an eating and drinking establishment. We'll, we will also have um, 89 accessory parking spaces. Only 64 of those spaces will be required and the additional 25 would be permitted parking, which as you stated in Council Member Vallone's statement, uh, the applicant has committed as part of the public review process to make these additional parking spaces available to the community. Um, and we even believe that some of the parking spaces that are required here um, may not be used by the tenants since many seniors wouldn't, may not have cars. The site plan. Um, and then the other proposed development is, an, will, is proposed as an eight story, 34,000 square foot multiple dwelling. 24 dwelling units of which 14 would be affordable independent residences for seniors and 19 accessory attended parking spaces. Okay. Um, and I, I'll just turn it over to Pala to give a brief statement. Hello. Uh, good morning. My name is Paula Duran. I'm the Director of Housing Development for HANAC. And as Jacqueline was uh, stating, we will be working with the team to make sure that the MIH units are marketing and managed correctly. Uh, so HANAC is a nonprofit organization founded in 1972 in Astoria. And we are a city-based social services and affordable housing developer organization uh, that provides a wide of uh, programs and services, most of them in Queens. HANAC owns and operates for full service senior residents that consist of more of uh, 400 units in Queens. And currently we have under construction uh, 232 units uh, in Flushing for low-income seniors and families. Uh, HANEC is fully committed uh, with the development of affordable housing and we support any efforts towards that goal. That is the main reason why HANEC will be working um, with the owner for these Douglaston projects uh, in order to act as the managing agent uh, for the affordable housing units for the seniors as presented on the proposal. HANEC's role will be uh, to do the marketing of the units and be the management agent of these MIH units. And in addition, HANAC will be providing uh, the social services for the tenants and community members. Uh, so HANAC is ex um, planning to expand its portfolio of social services to this community board uh, for tenants and community members. Um, thank you for the opportunity and for your consideration in this matter. Thank you. We're, we're just going to pause for one moment um, to take a vote. Continuing the vote on previously called uh, approval of previously called LU items, Council Member Rivera. Aye. By vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, uh, the LU items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. And we will now be closing uh, the vote uh, on today's items. Um, Thank you. So just a couple of questions. Um, can, can you walk us uh, through again the uh, AIRS component of your project? Sure. So um, the, develop the proposed development at 241-15 Northern Boulevard will have approximately 20 affordable independent residences for seniors. And then the proposed development at 4380 will have 14 affordable independent residences for seniors. And all of these units will be restricted at or below 80% AMI in compliance with the zoning resolution. Can you say that again? The, um, what was the AMI? 80% and below. Okay. Um, and so it, it will also comply with MIH option two, which requires an average, but the errors are more restrictive here. So we, we won't have units above 80% AMI. And, and how much of the FAR do you plan uh, to utilize at each of the development sites? Um, so uh, th for the AIRS FAR, um, actually 4380 Douglaston Parkway is not utilizing um, the AIRS bonus. 241-15, um, we, are, we are taking advantage of the FAR. Um, so I can get back to you on the exact um, square footage, but um, we, 
you're eligible up to a 3.9 FAR um, for through the proposed rezoning for the R6A. You can get that to us, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are the proposed developments that have been proposed here to use the preferential FAR for heirs? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, what is the percentage of units uh, that are expected to be uh, heirs uh, in each building? The percentage in 30% uh, in 30, both. 30%, okay. It's actually more uh, in, in the Douglaston Parkway because um, the way the, the building units were laid out, we had larger units originally, but because through the Euler process, um, we worked with the, um, the borough president's office has asked us to reduce the building one story. Um, so we are working on, we, we will have to, we, we're trying to maintain the 24 total dwelling units, um, but now we're gonna have one less story. So um, the, that was why there, there ended up being, there was more affordable units in terms of percentage wise than 30%, just because originally it had larger units. But now with the redesign, we will still maintain the 14 heirs units. Um, however, um, that percentage will maintain 30% units because the both projects will also, they're not seeking any um, public financing, but they will be looking for the affordable New York tax exemption, which re requires that 30% of the units be affordable. Okay, so total of 30. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the total square footage expected for the heirs uh, in each building? It's 30% of the residential floor area, because we're, we're using the MH option two here, so we would, we're, we are complying under both programs, heirs and MIH option two. So it's 30% of the residential floor area and at least 30% of the residential units. Uh, how will the, uh, these age restrictions uh, be enforced? Through a regulatory agreement with HPD. Okay. Uh, are there other additional approvals needed to restrict the age of residents uh, within the portion of the building? Not that we're aware of. There's, in, in our conversations with HPD, there will be an, a regulatory agreement that would have the age restriction in it and based on a number of conversations we've had, they also have spoken with the state human rights because we would need to have a waiver for a partial heirs building and they've also indicated that they're, that they would be supportive of such a waiver for a project, a senior project like this. Uh, are there uh, any state uh, waivers required for the uh, partial heirs building? Yes, from the state human rights um, related to the age restriction. Uh, have you met with DOT to review uh, any of the proposed changes to the intersection on Douglas and Parkway and Northern Boulevard? We have not yet met with DOT, but the, the developers committed um, to meet with DOT as we go for our builder's pavement plan for the site and any suggested mitigation measures we will incorporate into the proposed development. Got it. So maybe I, you're not gonna have the answer to this one, but any preliminary discussions on how to address the concerns about the traffic congestion at that intersection? I'm sorry, any preliminary discussions? Preliminary with you? discussions that uh, deal with addressing the concerns about the traffic congestion at that intersection. Uh, it was brought up in the community board meeting. The council member um, brought this up as well. So I'm just wanting to know if you had any discussions with anyone regarding that. Oh, uh, we we will work with the council members. Um. Okay, 
So we actually had spoken with some members of DOT and, and they have agreed to come out after the, the, if the rezoning is approved to do a site visit and um, to recommend some mitigation measures for the traffic in this area. Okay, so there, there has been some conversation with DOT? Yes. Yes? Okay. Um, what are the expected uh, commercial uses uh, at the development site uh, number two? It is proposed to, actually the restaurant that's located across the street is proposed to be relocated within, within our development site two. Okay, yes. so it's gonna be a restaurant? A restaurant, yes. Okay. Uh, and do you, can you provide a unit mix and the affordability you expect to uh, be included in the building? Currently, we are working on a unit distribution for both buildings, um, but we will have a mix of studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. And last question, uh, for development site number one, um, how do you plan to ensure that the windows of the building uh, on the south side of the project site will have uh, access to uh, light and air? Um, e even within the seven stories of the building, we're not changing the footprint of the building as it is proposed, which does provide um, the 30-foot uh, rear yard. Okay. Thank you um, for your testimony today. Thank you. Calling up uh, the next panel, uh, Edward. Lagana, did I say it right? Lagrasa. Lagrasa, I'm sorry. Uh, Brendan Levy and John Kurtz. <coughs> if you can <coughs> please state your name, you have two minutes and you can begin. Uh, if you can push the button. Oh, there you go. Is it on? Okay. Uh, I'm a member of Community Board 11's Landmark Committee. I'm a trustee of the Douglas and the Little Neck Historical Society, and I have been so for about 20 years. I am not representing them. I am representing uh, the community. I'm an active member in Douglaston. I'm an also an adjunct professor at NYU's Graduate School of Real Estate. I'm active in the ULI, both nationally and uh, locally. The proposed building that is being planned at the intersection of Douglaston Parkway and Northern Boulevard incorporates sound planning principles. It is focused on senior citizens. It is near public transportation. It is mid-rise, and it is contextual in keeping with the scale of the adjacent apartment buildings. It provides parking for local residents and small retailers, and I feel that is aesthetically pleasing. I've seen the drawings for the larger project and is the kind of development that will be good for the community, both on a need and an aesthetic basis. This is important to me as an active member of the community, an architect, and one interested in good design and preservation. At the <coughs> meeting on October 22nd at the community board, the developer discussed their two projects. However, most of the people in the room came to the meeting with a predetermined negative attitude. Providing correct information did not alter this attitude since many attendees, attendees were there to stop any development. There are several people in the community who are against all development and they are leading an opposition effort. They do not represent all the community. Prior to the October 22nd meeting, I received three phone calls from people asking me to protest a project they had never seen and all of them were misinformed. They did not want to be confused by facts, and they were all nimbium protests. Since October 22nd meeting, several people have quietly expressed support for the rezoning, but they were afraid to, uh, afraid to uh, uh, talk. I'm not afraid to support sound land use and development. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Brendan Levy with the Queen's Chamber.
Can you hear me now? Brendan Levy, Queens Chamber of Commerce, on behalf of the President and CEO, Tom Gretsch. I'm going to read a letter that Tom Gretsch signed. Uh, we are in support of the project uh, for the Douglas and Parkway Northern Boulevard rezoning, Block 8092, tax lots 5 and 39, portions of lots 205, 25, 28, and 33, known as the rezoning area. Uh, letters addressed to Council Member Ballone. I write in support of the proposal to change the rezoning area from R12 to an R6A zoning district. The rezoning proposal includes a commercial overlay at the intersection of Douglas and Parkway and Northern Boulevard and designation of a mandatory inclusionary housing or MIH area. The, pr the proposed rezoning will allow the development of two buildings. The building at 24115 Northern Boulevard will be a five-story building with 59 senior housing units, including about 20 units of permanently affordable senior housing plus 692 square feet of recreation space for seniors. There would also be a recreation space uh, for ancillary services. There will be, as noted earlier, 89 attended parking spaces, and the owner is committed that excess spaces that are underutilized will be available to the local community when shopping in the local commercial district. The second building at 4380 Douglason Parkway will be an eight-story apartment building with 24 dwelling units, about 14 of which will be permanently affordable for seniors through the MIH program. The second building will also contain about 1,400 square feet of community room space for seniors. All of the residential units within the two buildings will be marketed to seniors aged 55 and older, about 34 units or 30% of the residential floor area approximately. Um, will be permanently affordable for low-income seniors. In contrast to the citywide senior population, which is only 13%, seniors comprise 20% of the Douglaston population. In the blocks surrounding the rezoning area, the senior population increases to 22%. Queens Community Board 11 residents who are in need of affordable housing will be given preference to half of the permanently affordable units. The applicant thank, has also committed you, to you. working with local nonprofit organization, Panic, who spoke earlier, to provide thank, quality. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. We have two minutes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, anyway, the, the chamber is in support. Thank you. Um, and, thank and you. The, thank there's you. a great need for senior housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is John Kurtz. I will be reading uh, two letters uh, of whom are from the Community Board 11 and local residents of Douglaston, Queens. Uh, first will be from uh, George Mahaltis. Uh, dear New York City uh, City Council, I'm a local resident and I support the proposed ULURP and redevelopment of 241-15 Northern Boulevard and 43-80 Douglaston Parkway. The proposed development will improve the appearance of two unused sites that are currently in eyesore and have been for years. Additionally, the proposed buildings will fit in well contextually with adjacent buildings. Most importantly, the Northeast Queens community, especially in Douglaston, Little Neck, and the Bayside area, area, have an acute lack of affordable senior housing and services. I'm glad to hear that all the residential units will be marketed to seniors age 55 and older, including a, a significant number of affordable units. It is for these reasons that I support this proposal. Sincerely, George Mahaltis. Uh, the next letter will be from uh, Elias uh, Filas. Good morning, my name is um, Elias Filas. I live in Douglaston, Queens, and I'm currently a member of Community Board 11. I support this rezoning application because I would like to see the two lots in, uh, in, on Douglaston Parkway put to productive use. There are many older residents in the Douglaston area looking to relocate to smaller and more efficient and modern looking apartments like the ones being proposed. I think the design of the new, building, the new buildings fit in well with the neighborhood and would benefit the community by adding uh, the much needed senior housing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to call up the uh, next panel, uh, Zamir Khan, uh, Kelly Fernandez. Uh, excuse me if I, if I mispronounce it. Is it Sophia? Uh, you, how do you say that, your last name? Thank you. I just didn't want to butcher that one. I'm so sorry. Uh, we may begin. Uh, just please state your name and, uh, and you can start. Uh, I guess. 
Just okay. push the button. I'll begin. I wasn't. I was gonna do the ladies first, but it's okay. okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Zamir Khan. I work as a doorman in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Uh, I've been a member of 32BJ for the past nine years. Uh, I'm here today speaking on behalf of my union, not only as a member, but also as a lifelong resident of Queens to express our support for the Douglaston Parkway rezoning. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union in the country. We represent 80,000 building service workers here in New York City who clean and maintain buildings like the two being proposed today. 241-15 Northern LLC and North Shore Realty Group have committed to provide prevailing wage jobs for building service workers when their buildings open. These are family sustaining jobs that would allow workers to support their families and continue to live in Queens. 32BJ SEIU also fully supports affordable housing for seniors. We see this project as an important investment in creating an equitable and inclusive community in Little Neck, and we urge you to approve it. Thank you for your time and thank you for having us this morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kelly Fernandez. I'm here on behalf of the Queens Economic Development Corporation, um, reading a letter. I am writing in support of the proposal to change the zoning on the above reference site to allow for new development. The Queens Economic Development Corporation supports projects that it believes will benefit the community. In this case, the project calls for 59 units of much needed senior housing, recreation, and ancillary space. 20 of the units will be affordable. This is important as there are many deserving seniors in the community. Additionally, the local nonprofit de nonprofit designated to administer the senior housing and programming is well respected and has a great deal of experience in the borough. Good morning, I'm Sophia Uruia. Thank you. Um, thank you for hearing me. I'm here to support the rezoning for the two buildings. I have lived and worked in the area most of my adult life. Um, I'm happy to hear that there is going to be senior affordable housing, myself included. Um, we don't want to leave the neighborhood. And to know that that is going to be available is um, comforting to me. I'd like to stay there. Um, I don't think that the buildings are out of character. If you take a walk in the neighborhood, they're all about that same level that we're speaking of. And finally, I think that the additional foot traffic would be huge for the local mom and pop stores that lose a lot of business to the mall down the road. Um, so just to close, I, I do support it. Um, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today and for your testimony as well. Thanks. Uh, are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be uh, laid over. Uh, we are now going to our last uh, public hearing for today, uh, and it is uh, LUs 335, 336, and 337, uh, the uh, 570 Fulton Street rezoning for property in Majority Leader Cumbo's district in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to rezone property located at the intersection of Fulton Street and Flatbush Avenue from a C64 district to a C69 district. A series of related zoning text amendments to the special downtown Brooklyn uh, district regulations. These amendments would establish a maximum uh, permitted FAR of 18 uh, for commercial or community facility uses uh, that apply to the special district height setback and tower regulations uh, to C69 districts uh, and create a new special permit to allow modifications. Uh, to bulk requirements other than uh, FAR. There is also a special permit application pursuant to the proposed zoning text uh, to modify certain bulk yard and uh, lot coverage requirements. Uh, these actions would facilitate the development of a 40-story mixed-use uh, tower uh, with retail use on the ground and second floors, uh, office use on floors 3 through 16, and residential use on floors 17 through 40. Uh, I now uh, open the public hearing on this application. Um, we are calling uh, David Schwartz and Allison Car Carreri. Carreri. 
Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? As part of your response, please state your full name. Allison Carreri, yes. David Schwartz, yes. Uh, before we begin, I just want to read uh, the opening statement from uh, Majority Leader uh, Cumbo. Uh, good morning, and thank you all for attending this hearing. Uh, downtown Brooklyn is one of the most uh, rapidly changing parts of New York City. Uh, development pressure seems to increase by the day as we constantly learn of new plans for uh, ever larger towers. And these towers are far different than what was originally projected uh, by the 2004 rezoning. Uh, they contain prominently, uh, predominantly residential space instead of office space and often with little real affordable housing or provisions for local businesses, non-for-profit organizations, or cultural arts groups to share in the growth of our borough. The tremendous boom in downtown Brooklyn development has also placed increased stress on our infrastructure and neighborhood services. I constantly hear concerns from my constituents about the consequences of overdevelopment, uh, subways busting at the seams, uh, over-enrolled schools, long-time businesses uh, shuttering to be replaced by vacant storefronts or chain stores, and housing costs increase far above what they can afford. Uh, if we are to consider allowing significant new density on top of the tremendous development already occurring, we must be sure that significant public benefits are delivered to address these key challenges of affordability and infrastructure capacity. This project would be the first 18 FAR zoning district approved in downtown Brooklyn and would set a precedent for others to come. If we are going to consider, uh, consider uh, setting this precedent for density, I believe we must also set a precedent for significant public benefits, affordability, and inclusive development. Uh, I look forward to hearing from the developers on how they will address these issues uh, and from my constituents and the public on this important project for the future of downtown Brooklyn. Uh, thank you. And thank you, you Councilman. may begin. Thank you, Councilman. Good morning. Chairman. Allison Carreri, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Um, we're discussing a proposal for a rezoning and related actions to increase the maximum community uh, facility and commercial FAR uh, at the project site from 10 to 18 with no change in the maximum residential de density in order to facilitate the development of 87,000 square feet of much needed office space in downtown Brooklyn for local and growing companies. The project site is in the special downtown Brooklyn district at the intersection of Fulton Street and Flatbush Avenue in an existing C64 zoning district and fully surrounded by the C64 and a C64.5 zoning district, which are high density mixed use districts. 570 Fulton Street, the development site labeled DS on the screen, is located along Fulton Street. The proposed rezoning and related applications are made with respect to its redevelopment, utilizing air rights from the adjacent parcel at 1 Flatbush Avenue, which is controlled by uh, an affiliate of developer. The area to rezone, be rezoned consists of uh, lot 35, which is the development site 570 Fulton, lot 26, which is one Flatbush and will be merged as a single zoning lot with the development site, as well as a portion of lot 24, 25 Flatbush Avenue, which would not be part of the development site. Our ULERP application consists of the following actions. A rezoning of the affected area from C64 to C69, which under a text amendment would increase the maximum permitted commercial and or com community facility FAR in the C69 district from 10 to 18 and maintain the maximum residential FAR at 12. Uh, it would also include text amendments to establish the maximum uh, of 18 FAR and to create a new special permit that would permit bulk waivers other than FAR waivers on irregular sites in C69 districts within the special district. And we would seek a special permit under that new special permit application uh, for modifications of setback, rear yard, court recess, and tower lot coverage. And those uh, special permit waivers are in order to allow better floor plates um, and a shorter building overall. And as, as I mentioned, the primary purpose of the application is to allow for approximately 87,000 square feet of office space, which otherwise would not be developed, um, to be provided in the new building. <coughs> if the actions are approved, 570 Fulton would be redeveloped with an approximately 202 square f thousand square foot, 40 story building, about 45% of which would be commercial um, on 17 commercial floors. 
including 87,000 square feet of office area. The office floor plates would range from about 4,800 to 5,700, sorry, to 7,500 square feet. That is a small typo there. Um, and these relatively small floor plates would be best suited for small local companies and uh, growing companies in the area. Um, above the commercial floors, we would have 23 stories of residential rental units, um, approximately 139 units total. Um, because no residential density increase is associated with these actions, the project isn't sub subject to MIH, but the developer is providing um, 25 to 30% of the units as um, affordable units under the Affordable New York program, and a portion of those units could also be permanently affordable uh, in order to increase the residential FAR from 10 to 12 under the voluntary, MI, uh, voluntary inclusionary program um, in the R10 districts. The, this shows a section and rendering of the building. Um, you can see the proportion of office to residential space. Um, the base of the building, which all would be commercial, would rise 10 stories before a 10-foot setback from Fulton Street, above which seven more stories of office use would be provided. Um, and above that, 23 stories of residential. Um, above the base, we would also set back from the side lot line with the adjacent tower successive uh, 10 feet segments. Um, within the commercial base, we've also discussed with Councilmember Cumbo incorporating a cultural use or nonprofit component um, in a, a manner that we could tie into the, the, these applications, either through a change to the approved drawings or a text change, and David can talk about that a bit more. Um, the building would rise to a maximum height of 518 feet and 40 stories. And here you can see how that looks in the context of adjacent surrounding towers. Um, the build, although we're seeking an 18 FAR rezoning because of the existing 12 uh, FAR building on one Flatbush, which would be part of the zoning lot, um, the building would ultimately built, be built to 11.5, the new building would be built to 11.5 FAR. The remaining 7.5 FAR would be within the one Flatbush building on the zoning lot. And that, together with the special permit waivers we're seeking, results in a 40-story building that we feel is in line with the surrounding development. The special permit waivers we seek are all intended to improve the floor plates, make them a little bit larger, and overall um, decrease the total height of the building. The first one is for a setback waiver in order to set back 10 feet at 150 feet rather than what would be required under the current tower regs, which would be 20 feet at, 85, at a height of 85 feet. Um, a waiver for the 20 foot required commercial rear yard, a waiver for the residential rear yard that would be required, as well as an inner court recess waiver, which is only required due to the merger of the two uh, parcels as a single zoning lot um, and wouldn't affect the light and air of the one Flatbush uh, units. Um, the final waiver we're seeking is a tower lot coverage waiver that, again, results just from the merger of the two parcels as a single zoning lot. It results in um, a lot coverage above a height of 150 feet that is in excess of the tower uh, requirements. Um, something that we've discussed and heard a lot about in the public review process is the impact of the project on the subway station at Nevin Street, which is directly adjacent to one Flatbush on Flatbush Avenue. Um, there isn't an entrance adjacent to the 570 building. Um, we you know, seek to help that subway entrance get considerable improvements. Um, the problem is that the MTA hadn't previously identified specific improvements that they would like to have be made at that uh, subway entrance other than certain improvements that developers affiliate already undertook uh, in connection with the development of the one Flatbush building. Um, so in furtherance of, of making further improvements to that station, um, including potential uh, much better access for ADA, um, the developer has agreed to make a $550,000 contribution to fund a study that the MTA would be able to put towards identifying improvements that are 
that need to be made and can feasibly be engineered for that uh, subway station. Um, and I'll turn it over to David to talk more about that and, and add yeah, anything else. So regarding the subway station, that was a something that came up from community board and that was a recommendation from the borough president's um, office as well as from city planning. So it's something that we very much agree with. I think the challenge there is that the Nevin Street subway station, it's pressed right up against Flatbush Avenue and it's very high up. So it's there's no room really to get across with an ADA access. So it's a, it's a really tough station and the MTA realizes that and they they need to figure out, they, they really need to commission a study in order to figure out what needs to be done because it's not an easy solution. Um, so it's something that we're happy as um, landlords there. We think, we agree that the Nevin Street station as well as unfortunately many stations need you know significant improvements. That, was that, okay, great. So just a, a couple of questions. Uh, the zoning that we're, um, voting to allow uh, uh, to give here uh, gives you the ability uh, to build a hotel. Are you going to build a hotel? We are not going to build a hotel. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's important to note here is this lot is a very irregular lot. So all of the waivers that we're seeking um, are to make the floor plate big. It's not a floor plate that would work as a hotel. Um, and we're committed to put in writing that we're not going to build a hotel. I'll uh, also note as a process matter, you know, city planning approved this project because they wanted offices here. The special permit plans that have been approved in connection with the application by city planning state um, that the commercial uses will be used groups 6A and 6B, um, retail and office use, uh, yeah, retail and office use and do a, a change to use group five if we were building pursuant to the special permit would require going back and getting a modification, which we don't think city planning is interested in approving. Great, and in writing would be? Uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to work with, with, uh, with uh, council, with, uh, with the city with council, for the city council to put that into writing. Great, thank you. Um, so there's no uh, MIH in this project, correct? There's no increase to residential FAR, I think, is an important point, so that's why there's no MIH, but we are um, agreeing to do the Affordable New York program. Right. So going to the uh, 421A uh, Affordable New York program, uh, what are the options there? So there are three options we've discussed with the council member of, I think it's option A or option one. I, they keep changing whenever we they change the, the names once we figure it out. And that is an option of 10% of the units at 40% AMI, 10% at 60% AMI, 5% up to 130. Although in our conversations with the council member this week, we talked about the 5% at 130, lowering that 5% of 130 down to 5% at 100. We have not finalized that, but that's the current discussion. Okay, uh, so that would be option A. Yeah. Uh, because we know that affordable housing at 130 AMI um, is hardly affordable. Um, you know, those rents are going to be over $2,000 uh, per month. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you're committing to lowering the AMIs uh, on those units. I know that that's very important to the majority leader. Um, how are you looking to memorialize that commitment? Again, we're open to put that as well as all the commitments into writing, um, and we are um, we're committed to work with the city council and with council member Cumbo and her office to memorialize all of those items. We'd also be happy to notify HPD of the same um, intention to and, pursue and, that. And action. any other recommendations that there are, we are happy to comply. Great. Um, and will you partner with a local non-for-profit uh, to, to be the administering agent uh, for uh, the affordable housing? Yeah, we will partner if we have not already with Impact. Uh, th that this would be this will be our third project with Impact. That was formerly um, PAC Pro Area Community Council. This will be our third project with them. Um, and if we have not already signed an agreement with them, we will sign an agreement with them. And they have done uh, they've done other lease ups for us in the neighborhood. Right. Um, so I know that one of the 
very important issues for uh, the majority leader has always been uh, the space for cultural and non-for-profits, um, especially for projects that uh, involve adding significant commercial density. Um, you know, I know she believes uh, that there should be some stronger tools for reserving the space uh, for arts and cultural organizations in the new development. Uh, will you reserve a portion of the commercial space in the building for uh, an arts or cultural use or for a non-for-profit office space? Yes, we are prepared to do that. We agree with uh, the majority leader that it is important to keep the, um, the cultural district, which is what we, one of the things that we love so much about this area is that cultural district. So we are in discussions with, with, uh, with Council Member Cumbo and her office as to how exactly what that means, but we are committed to um, having space for um, cultural and or nonprofits. Yeah. Um, and lastly, will you consider uh, a preference for independent local retail uh, in the retail space for this project? So that's something that we'll have to take under consideration um, and discuss with the team. Um, one second. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Council Member uh, Levin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, I want to uh, also ask a few questions on behalf of uh, Council Member or Majority Leader Cumbo. Um, just following up on the on the uh, commercial affordability or not not for profit cultural space, um, would you work with us to pursue potential options to require that that happen in the zoning? Uh, sure, we're totally open to any mechanisms to you know to require whatever we agree to. Okay. So any mechanisms that you guys can think of, you know, we're totally yeah, open. Yeah, we've we've had some initial discussions with staff in terms of uh, changes that we could make to either the approved drawings or the zoning text um, in a way that would be in scope um, that would that would tie us in to that commitment. Okay. Um, the, uh, w why did, do you know why the one Flatbush building received a waiver for the requirement to build a new subway series? So that was, one Flatbush was your development? Uh, yeah, okay. so um, the MTA didn't want to put the subway stairs into the building. They, they actually wanted to keep the subway um, entrance adjacent, you know, where it is right now, right at Flatbush Avenue. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of an older view where they, you know, at one point in time they were, I, I think in like the early, the 90s, I think they were moving a lot of subway stations inside buildings. Yeah. They decided they didn't want to do that. So that was at the MTA's discretion. And, and it was very related to the engineering challenges that David described earlier, which relate to instead of being able to go down one set of stairs to the subway platform, the only way to keep the platform in its current location would be to tunnel underneath the stairs and build stairways the, back There up, are two subway tunnels that come- alone wouldn't really so improve On Fulton ADA Street issues. and Flatbush Avenue, so they both come like this, and the, the, uh, the four or five on Flatbush Avenue is actually like touching our building, so when we excavate it at one Flatbush, it's actually touching the building, so it's so close. So mm -hmm. it's a very, it's a, and it's also a, the train kind of turns when it comes in there. It's a challenging uh, station for them. Okay. Um, can you, I mean, in light of this tragedy that happened this week um, with a young mother who, who, um, who died falling down the, the stairs at a subway station in Manhattan, um, you know, I think that there's a, an increased focus on ADA um, or accessibility at our subway stations. Can you describe um, the agreement with City planning and the MTA to advance ADA uh, access to the Nevin Street Station. Sure, uh, and the agreement that has been put in writing to the chair of the City Planning Commission is that the developer will make a $550,000 contribution to the MTA um, to fund the MTA's study of improvements that can be made to the Nevin Street Station, particularly with respect to ADA access. Mm -hmm. We there's no kind of s current scope of what that will entail other than, you know, that they're going to look at. That's a commitment made by, the, by your team. Yeah. yeah, and that was something, you know, th that kind of came out of conversations with the borough president where, mm -hmm. you know, th the conversations that he and his staff had was that there, 
there are going to be a lot. There's going to still be a lot of development, specifically at this intersection. If you look around, and the problem is that if you ask the MTA today what they need, they don't know yet because they need to do that study. Yeah. So really, the idea I was mean they that should. At, you know, at this point. That's. Yeah. <laughs> I won't. I won't get into that. I think. Uh, I, um, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that we want to have some definitive. So this way that they can have some definitive needs um, as downtown Brooklyn continues to develop. And for us, we totally agree. And mm -hmm. we agree with, with you, and it is a tragedy, and we agree with everything that you mm -hmm. and your colleagues have said that there needs to be you know, quite a few fixes to the MTA, and mm -hmm. you know, this station is certainly one of them that yeah. we want to see um, you know, continue to be fixed. Yeah. yeah. So the, and the hope being that the improvements identified in connection with that study could ultimately be tied in with future applications. Yeah, this statement, yeah, this station is a, a dismal station. I, I, there's a, there's a staff member here at the council that reminds me every uh, every couple of weeks that there's. Uh, I take the train from there. I mean, it's it's a tough station. It's a bad station. Yeah, um, falling, chipping, peeling paint, and uh, you know. And there's just a lot of challenges. There's a lot of infrastructure underneath that station also, so it's a. It's very neglected by the MTA. Very neglected. Agreed. Um, public art at Fox Square. Can you, because um, it's an important location in terms of gateway to downtown Brooklyn, um, will you commit to working with local arts organizations on public art at Fox Square? Absolutely. I mean, we would love to do that. And actually, we've had some um, uh, conversations with Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. They have some really amazing ideas, so we would love to work with them, other groups, local artists. It's something that's um, near and dear to our heart. We love it. Okay. Something that the, the council member has been mentioning to us for years as this project's been going on, so we'd be committed to do that. Um, sustainability and resiliency, uh, what are those measures in, uh, proposed or contemplated for this project? So we did submit that to the borough president. We can okay. submit that, I don't know offhand, but we're happy to um, submit. We had, we had done a write-up on all the sustainability features okay. um, from the architect, so we're happy to submit that. Um, Certainly we'd encourage Green roofs, solar roofs, green solar, you know, the combinations or, you know. Yeah, we're, we, we agree on sustainability and we, mm -hmm. we'll, we can submit to, um, to whoever um, at the council uh, what we plan to do there. Okay. Um, right, uh, passive house or net zero, anything like that would be, would be well received here. Um, uh, and lastly, uh, regard to building service workers, uh, is there a commitment to uh, good jobs since uh, there's going to be a commercial, commercial component is here as well. So. Yes, we we have an agreement with 32BJ, okay. um, and they, um, I believe, are here to testify, but we've, we already have an agreement with them for 570 Fulton as well as one Flatbush. Okay. And then uh, do you have a plan in place for local hiring and NWB participation? Yes, we will. We've already, um, we, okay. we have an agreement with Team Brown Consulting, um, and we will continue to do local hiring. Yeah. Good, how are you? And we, we have a, a commitment to continue to do that, um, and we do that on all of our projects. Okay, thank you, that's all for me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Um, I'm gonna now call the next panel, uh, Cassandra uh, Carrillo. May you. Good morning, Cha Chair Moya and council members. My name is May Yu. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate at the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, uh, where my role is uh, leading our research on job and firm growth, um, as well as speaking with potential tenants about opportunities to um, locate their offices in Downtown Brooklyn. And on behalf of DBP, I'd like to express our strong support for the proposed project at 570 Fulton Street. Um, as the applicant mentioned, the pr proposal, as we understand it, only um, asks for a upzoning for commercial only while limiting the residential uh, FAR to their as of right, uh, as allowed per current zoning. And in doing so, they would really be able to provide the much needed office space. In fact, about um, 87,000 square feet of commercial office, which if fully tenanted, could yield up to 400 plus office jobs um, near the intersection of Fulton Street and Flatbush Avenue. As many of you know, downtown Brooklyn is the city's third largest central business district and has seen record job and business growth over the um, past several years. 
in fact, outpacing the growth of Brooklyn as a borough as well as New York City as a borough. And we've seen particularly strong growth in the tech and information and arts and entertainment sectors. Um, despite a very constrained office market, uh, downtown Brooklyn has had about a two to 7% office, um, office vacancy in the past several years. Um, and that uh, indicates a really high demand for office space um, compared to about 10 to 12% in the financial district in Midtown Manhattan. Um, the project would meet additional demand and would support continued job growth in the cultural district just two blocks away from two subway stations and Flatbush Avenue. Um, we've seen and spoken to a number of creative companies such as Blue State Digital, which is known for uh, their digital campaigns and launch of uh, Obama for America, as well as Gimlet Media, um, the uh, Brooklyn's favorite podcasting company, um, take space at small floor plate offices along Flatbush Avenue, um, as well as uh, FX Collaborative, the architecture company who is um, headquartered, uh, will now be headquartered a few blocks away. Again, 570 Fulton's uh, small floor, floor plate offices ca catering specifically to small businesses and entrepreneurs would help to spur job growth in the area. Um, and it's something we um, extremely support. Uh, just additionally, um, Downtown Brooklyn Partnership helps to maintain Fox Square as part of our bid services um, and Plaza program with DOT. And we have been working with local arts organizations such as BRIC, BAM, and as part of uh, Department of Cultural Affairs City Canvas program to look at additional arts installations in the area. And we're happy to work with Slate and with the uh, landlords of 570 Fulton to make sure that that's incorporated there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Moya. My name is uh, Cassie Garrillo, and I work for 32BJ. I'm speaking today on behalf of my union to express our support for the pros proposed project at 570 Fulton. 32BJ also represents over 700 workers who live in District 35. It's our estimation that when open, this building will be staffed by about six building service workers. 570 Fulton LLC, an affiliate of Slate, has committed that these jobs will be good jobs with family sustaining wages. <coughs> these are the types of jobs that give New Yorkers dignity and access to mobility. 32BJ and Slate have been building a strong relationship throughout their portfolio, and we are confident that they will be a responsible employer at this site. We urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Are there any other members of the public who wish to uh, testify? Yeah. Can you fill out a slip? I do. With the Sergeant at Arms? No. You have to fill out a speaker slip with the Sergeant at Arms? Good morning, council members. My name is Cole Okai. I'm from the surrounding area over there by 50, 570 Fulton Street and um, Ingersoll Houses. And over the past year, the Slate Group has demonstrated great commitment to our community. They have been undergoing a lot of changes in our community, and they have been front and forward with it. I'm giving out from book bag drives to organizing things. And um, Brooklyn right now is very heavily populated and they have a lot of um, creative minds and this office space is very needed that the Slate, great, the Slate Group is talking about. The affordable office space is very needed because, you know, the traveling, you don't have to travel and you know, you can hire people in the neighborhood to them small businesses to hire people in the neighborhood. So I think that that's a great, great idea, especially for a small business owner like me that's looking forward to it. What kind of business do you have? Oh, um, I make t-shirts. Very nice. I think I make t-shirts, anything you want. I'm gonna have to come visit you then. <laughs> Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your testimony. Excuse me. 
Oh, it's okay. I will fill this out. Uh, yep. Okay. Just state you, you could just state your name and yes. then you can. Ali Carrington. Okay, I live in the district and I'm just really here to just hopefully you guys can pass the project so that we can get jobs and housing for the area. Much needed, you know, and we can continue to uh, be a part of the change in downtown Brooklyn. That's great. Thank you. You want to ask me anything? No, I think we're good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you, have, do you have anybody else? Anyone else from? Hi, How are you doing? I'm just here to if, talk about uh, the 570 Fulton Project. Uh, just state your name and then you can begin. My name is Dia Plunkett. And uh, this project is much, much needed in the neighborhood for, it's much more a good suggestion for our neighborhood for just for everything to work better. Stay optimistic for the future for everybody. Um, but this is a very much uh, needed program for me, another, a lot of people. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of shaky, but I'm just no, working don't worry. rolling Take with the time. program, sir. No, it's okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very much optimistic about this program, and I think that it'll do a lot for everyone in the community. Um, and I'm here to represent my family, uh, everyone before me here. And uh, this is a much needed program. That's all I can say for the moment. <laughs> so, right. Well, thank you, I appreciate you coming down here uh, and testifying. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, okay. have a great day. Okay, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Okay, seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, this concludes today's meeting and I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, council, and land use staff for all their great work uh, to get this done. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.